Greetings, everyone. I'm Frances Arnold, co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology with Frances Collins and Maria Zuber. I'd like to open this meeting by welcoming the members of the public and PCAST members who, who are here. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this meeting is public and is on the record. Information about PCAST can be found at whitehouse.gov PCAST. I welcome you to go there to uh, meet the members. I'd also like to introduce to the public a new member of PCAST, Dr. Dennis Asanis, who is the president of the University of Delaware. Maria, would you, uh, actually Francis Collins, would you like to welcome people as well? Well, yes, very briefly. I'm really glad that we can have what I think is going to be a very interesting session about semiconductors. And thanks to those who have joined us who are going to tell us from their perspective what kind of opportunities might exist here for the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. It's my great privilege to serve as co-chair along with Francis Arnold and Maria Zuber. And I will now turn this over to Maria. Okay, thank you very much, Francis. And um, I would like to add um, my welcome to uh, PCAST members, to our speakers, and to the members of the public who have taken the time to join in. So our session today addresses challenges and opportunities for US leadership in semiconductors. The semiconductor industry is an important pillar of US manufacturing, and semiconductors represent an enabling technology critical to almost all sectors of society. The preeminent position that the U.S. has held in semiconductors and microelectronics more generally is being seriously challenged with other countries investing significant resources to build manufacturing capability and develop a skilled workforce. Taiwan and South Korea in particular have established enviable competitive positions in the production of high-end chips. Today, U.S. tech firms depend on Taiwan to manufacture up to 90% of their chips. Not surprisingly, there is tremendous interest on the part of the administration and Congress to ensure long-term US leadership in semiconductors. To help inform PCAST on this topic, we have a group of distinguished speakers who represent many different parts of the semiconductor um, ecosystem, uh, ranging from large companies down to startups to the academic community. So our speakers today, um, Pat Gelsinger, is the chief executive officer at Intel. Throughout his career, Pat has led large scale efforts in cloud infrastructure, enterprise mobility, and cybersecurity. He managed the creation of industry technologies such as USB and Wi Fi and played key roles in the development of the Intel Core and Intel Xeon processor families. Priyanka Reyna is an assistant professor of electrical engineering at Stanford University. Priyanka's research is on creating high performance and energy efficient architectures for domain specific hardware accelerators in existing and emerging technologies and agile hardware software co-design. Rodrigo Liang Samba is CEO and co-founder of Samba Nova Systems. He is a business and engineering leader working to drive improvements to artificial intelligence he and his co-founders designed a full stack hardware and software platform optimized for AI workflows. Uh, Art Degus is a co-founder of Synopsys. Art has led Synopsys' mission to deliver the automation breakthroughs required to advance electronic design through the development of electronic design automation or EDA, silicon IP and application security testing. Finally, John Neufer uh, is president and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association. As the leader of SIA, John focuses on understanding the nexus of technology, public policy, and trade, and works to foster growth and innovation in semiconductor design, manufacturing, and research. So speakers uh, are allotted about 10 minutes each and will follow the presentations uh, with general questioning from PCAST members. So Pat. Thank you. And it is a pleasure to address the, uh, uh, this uh, awesome body of the uh, PCAST uh, members. And uh, today we see that every aspect of human existence is becoming digital. Everything digital runs on semiconductors. So literally our society is running on semiconductors and increasingly so. 
It's how we stay connected. It's how we've schooled, right? It's how we've uh, worked the greatest migration of the human workforce in history uh, through uh, COVID and an essential element of not only the economy, but our national security. And to keep pace with this, you know, we need to keep building leading edge semiconductor capabilities. And we believe that the federal government you know, can and should do significantly more to uh, assure the U.S. Uh, semiconductors industry uh, health and uh, leadership. And currently, the U.S. Congress is working on the CHIPS Act. And uh, you know, between the Senate version and the House version, we're now uh, in the uh, conference uh, process. And uh, today, I commend the PCAS for uh, uh, convening this session, specifically on the challenges and opportunities. You know, when we think about U.S. semiconductor leadership, we think about the you know, role of semiconductor research and development, you know, uh, recommendations that uh, NSTC, uh, the uh, National Semiconductor Technology Center, has conceived as part of the CHIPS Act would be, and what we do for our future workforce. Just starting briefly, Intel. You know, one of the world's top R&D companies. Uh, we spent over 15 billion, about 20% of our revenue, one of the most intensive uh, R&D companies in the world. And uh, we do that as we have for our 53 year career in the US majority. And our R&D and our manufacturing is majority in the US. And we've, uh, as I say, I like to uh, joke, we put our chips on the table with our commitments on investments. And uh, since I've taken over as CEO a little bit over a year ago, uh, we've been very bold in laying out our investment strategies to help rebuild U.S. leadership and manufacturing of the most advanced technologies and chips uh, in the world. We do believe that public-private partnership, though, is essential to accomplish uh, this rebuilding of the uh, industry. And historically, the federal government has played a very critical role in the success of the long-term uh, U.S. semiconductor industry. And we do think there's a need for a significant increase. And we see ourselves, you know, as our founder, Andy Grove, used to say, at an inflection point where if actions aren't taken, we could see a continued decline. If actions are taken, we can see a meaningful uh, rise and shift. And we have, as a company, we've uh, thrived in this relentless pursuit of semiconductor innovation. And as I like to say, you know, uh, until the periodic table is exhausted, Moore's law is alive and well, because we will will it to be such uh, into the uh, future. And it's provided this technological backbone behind the greatest period of human innovation, wealth creation, and we believe that we're still in the thick of it. Uh, the demand for low latency, high performance, higher density uh, compute, we think is... Uh, 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 almost inexhaustible as we are now simulating everything, creating, you know, uh, new medicines, uh, metaverses, uh, you know, establishing uh, digital twins of everything. And uh, we, for instance, have just uh, launched our Zetascale initiative. You know, we're just passing Exascale and we're already worried about how in the next five years we can deliver Zetascale uh, computing, 10 to the 24th. Uh, operations uh, per second and deliver literally petascale computing to every human uh, on the uh, planet. And, you know, as we think about the second half of the decade, we see that these advancements, particularly in advanced lithographic uh, nodes such as EUV, extreme ultraviolet, you know, will represent over 40% of uh, wafers will be done on such advanced uh, technologies. And very few companies are able to both have the R&D as well as the capital capacity to participate. You know, we do think that we're at this phase of a digital renaissance where semiconductors not only are serving as an important element, but increasingly an essential element of this new normal in our world uh, today. Uh, sometimes as I quip, uh, geopolitics was defined over the last five decades by where the oil reserves are. I believe the next decades will be defined by where the fabs are. It is that important to the future. We do think of NSTC as having a critical role. You know, this is suggested as the creation of this uh, uh, National Semiconductor Technology Center as an element of the CHIPS Act, and we fully support uh, that uh, piece. We believe it should be structured 
as a, a set of uh, nationwide hubs that uh, are uh, placed with uh, U.S. companies and other facilities that leverage existing infrastructures to minimize the cost of them, but also maximize the bridge between the public and the private uh, as well. And we're proposing that Intel be one of the uh, hubs, at least in the area of advanced lithography, uh, potentially as well in the area of advanced uh, packaging uh, technology. We see that there are significant areas for breakthroughs uh, ahead, uh, aligning different uh, revolutionary goals over the next five years. And we believe that uh, such uh, research work will not only result in a vibrancy in the technology industry, but also should be focused on delivering manufacturing at scale in the United States. We think NSTC should uh, fund both early stage pre-competitive R&D as well as late stage work to assure that prototyping and other efforts are being uh, integrated into our supply chains. Uh, there should be a multi-year roadmap of projects that, and uh, long-term objectives, as well as a constant vetting of them through such as a technical advisory committee of industry and academia is to assure that the future needs of the U.S. semiconductor manufacturers uh, are met. And we do think that the federal government should allow the NSTC to be an independent entity to mitigate uh, conflicts of interest, should fund the NSTC with the private sector and enable long-term sustainment and oversight of such an effort. Finally, workforce. Uh, you know, clearly, you know, establishing uh, technology leadership is all about having people leadership and uh, talent fundamentally in research, design, manufacturing, packaging requires a reliable uh, workforce in areas of STEAM and STEM. Uh, the uh, need for such is forecasted to grow CAGR of 10% uh, per annum uh, this decade. You know, un unfortunately, you know, U.S. students have uh, chosen other some uh, areas as opposed to manufacturing and semiconductors, and we have to bring a vibrancy back to this uh, area. And uh, we believe that uh, institutional barriers, increasing access to state-of-the-art STEM education, as well as uh, reaching into diverse uh, communities as well for future technologies is essential. And as part of the CHIPS Act, uh, we do believe that uh, steps should be taken to ensure that we unlock these uh, talent and education developments with increased grants, research fellowships uh, at the collegiate level, and even reaching all the way to the uh, high school uh, level. Uh, we are committed as part of this to be doing our part. For instance, as we announced our recent uh, new site in Ohio, we also committed to a $100 million investment over the decade to establish semiconductor manufacturing, as well as partnership with National Science Foundation and uh, partnering with uh, you know, Midwest uh, universities and research to expand their education and workforce development program. And I'll say when we launched our Ohio facility, what we've termed the Silicon Heartland, you know, the response from that community has been nothing short of spectacular and their enthusiasm to partner with us to rebuild manufacturing and technology leadership on American uh, soil. Uh, we do see that uh, many of these uh, programs can reach not that only at the highest academic levels, but community college and all the way back into the uh, high school. And we have a number of very successful uh, programs that we can now uh, replicate in uh, community colleges as well as in uh, high school uh, programs. You know, as we, in conclusion, you know, it's been about a half a century since semiconductors began commercially shipping. Today, they're the foundation for essentially all forms of technology innovation. And yet it feels like, and now with uh, my own career of 40 years in the uh, industry, 30 years in semiconductors and uh, 10 years in software, it does feel like we're entering a golden age for semiconductors. And I do think that we have a narrow window, this inflection point to take decided actions. We have certainly pledged to do that with Intel's investments. Uh, the financial uh, aggressiveness that we've laid out, you know, I'm taking the company free cash flow negative for the first time in four decades 
but we need to do more and we need to do it more significantly. We think the depth and breadth of you know, these uh, research areas and silicon platform software, new materials at scale manufacturing, advanced two and 3D packaging, and the relentless pursuit of Moore's law, we have an extraordinary opportunity in the U.S. to continue to be the nation that fuels the digital renaissance of the world, positions us economically and for our national defense. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Pat, for those comments. Uh, Priyanka? Am I up? Slides all set? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Priyanka Rana, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford University. Uh, today, I will present uh, my views on how to accelerate semiconductor innovation in the United States. And specifically, I will answer some of the questions posed by the PCAST Working Group on Semiconductor Design. So what are the largest challenges and opportunities for the US semiconductor industry? I believe that the US strength lies in its ability to innovate, okay? However, innovation in the semiconductor industry is being limited today by these three key challenges. Uh, the first one is the slowdown of Moore's law, which means that we no longer can solely rely on transistor scaling to achieve cost, performance, and efficiency improvements. The second challenge is the enormous complexity of designing end-to-end -end hardware software systems today, which makes it very difficult for small teams to innovate. And partially because of that, the student interest in semiconductor design has been declining for the last several years, and this has created a workforce shortage. However, these challenges also present a tremendous opportunity for dramatic reinvention of system design. This reinvention will be similar to the one in the 1980s when chip design moved from a few large companies uh, with in-house fabs uh, to many small fabless ones. And this was enabled by electronic design automation or EDA tools that greatly simplified chip design and in the process made it accessible to a much larger set of people allowing them to innovate. So the question is, how do we achieve this reinvention? There are several areas of research which will be crucial to invest in to do that. Uh, the first one is the design of domain-specific hardware accelerators. These are chips that are specialized for a particular application domain and therefore achieve higher performance and efficiency than a general purpose CPU. These accelerator chips are and will continue to be key drivers of large-scale deployment of emerging applications such as machine learning, image processing, video coding, cryptography, et cetera. However, the problem is that designing these accelerators incurs very large design, verification, and software engineering costs. Notably, if you look at the figure on the right, it shows that the cost of designing the software stack that allows running applications on these accelerator chips is actually much larger uh, than designing the chip itself. And in fact, the total cost is close to half a billion dollars in advanced technology nodes. So research is needed on tools and methodologies to reduce this cost of design and verification of systems. Sorry, my slides. Uh, so particularly, there are several uh, areas of research that are of interest. Um, and some of the ones are the ones that I've listed here. So the first very important one is research on raising the level of abstraction for design verification, uh, automating the co-design of these programmable accelerators and compilers for fast changing application domains, and tools for large scale design space exploration and optimization of these systems. So as a concrete example at Stanford, we have created a system. Uh, that uh, generates both the hardware accelerator 
as well as the software compiler from a single formal specification of the hardware. And this greatly reduces the cost of manually updating the compiler for every hardware change. So in addition to that, uh, other areas of research revolve around reducing barriers of entry for semiconductor startups. So if you look at semiconductor startups today, they spend a large fraction of design time and investment on non-innovative portions of the design. And these portions are too complex to build from scratch. And they're also very complex to build by putting together existing IP. As you can see from the figure on the left, the innovative custom chiplet is a very small fraction of the full system on chip or SOC that you need in order to ship a product. And this SOC typically includes a big general purpose processor, a complete memory system, chip-to-chip -chip interfaces, high-speed I.O., power delivery network, clock generation, test and debug circuitry. And on top of all of that hardware, a very large software stack for managing interactions between the SOC and the custom chiplet that you're actually interested in designing. So in order to reduce the time to market, we need to create a chiplet ecosystem which provides an existing working platform system on chip plus its entire software, chat, software stack to which innovative chiplets can attach using advanced packaging techniques. And I firmly believe that similar to the EDA revolution of the 1980s, this would enable small teams to prototype and demonstrate their ideas which, with much lower investment and usher in a new wave of innovation in system design. So finally, I would like uh, to talk about the last challenge, which is how do we attract more students to the semiconductor industry? Um, students are drawn to areas that capture their interest and imagination. But to capture interest, it is important to empower small groups to innovate and create exciting systems. So just as I described before, this is not possible with today's complex chip design approach. And therefore, interest in this area has been declining for many years. And students have moved towards computer science, which allows faster prototyping and ability to innovate and create startups and do exciting projects. So specifically, if you look at the student enrollment in electrical engineering, it has been declining for several years. Over here on the left, you can see enrollment in chip design classes, uh, particularly EE271, which is the class that I teach at Stanford. And you can see that it is much lower today than what it was in the early 2000s. However, uh, more recently, uh, we have introduced new classes at Stanford uh, so you can see that in the figure on the right, which uh, zooms in on the last five years. Uh, and we can see that uh, by introducing new classes that allow students to create systems and prototype the chips that they design in their projects, we are seeing a gradual increase uh, of uh, student enrollment, not just in the prototyping class EE272, but also in the feeder class EE271. So this brings me to my recommendation. Um, what is needed to teach more chip design courses at your US universities? I've slightly modified this question. We don't really need more chip design courses. We need exciting chip design courses. And what we have to do is to reinvigorate uh, student interest by supporting prototyping of student design chips. And this requires giving access to multi-project paper fabrication runs through a Moses-like aggregator, uh, industry standard EDA tools and computing infrastructure to run these chip design flows. And the EDA tools and computing infrastructure actually is a smaller problem. Most of it already exists, but this fabrication run part is very important. And then finally, uh, the government should also fund universities to develop, maintain, and freely share chip design flows and libraries. This large part is actually quite important since teaching such a class at a university requires a very significant effort uh, on the part of the faculty member and the whole teaching staff, the TAs. And it's it is important to reduce that barrier by allowing easy sharing of curriculum uh, and flows created by other universities. Uh, so to summarize, what would I like to see from a National Semiconductor Technology Center? 
I would like the NSTC to, one, support research on tools to dramatically reduce the time and cost for design, verification, and deployment of systems with domain-specific accelerators. Second, create a chiplet ecosystem, which provides a platform SOC along with a full software stack to which innovative chiplets can attach using advanced packaging, and this will greatly increase innovation. And then finally, reinvigorate student interest in semiconductors by supporting chip design and prototyping classes, and that will feed directly into our workforce problems. Um, that's all I had for today. Thank you so much. Priyaka, thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to Rodrigo. Great. See this okay? Looks good, Rodrigo. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for the, the invitation. It's an honor to be here to uh, contribute to the PCAST and uh, some of the recommendations that are coming out of uh, this discussion that uh, I think are really important for uh, the, the, the future of semiconductor advancement in the United States. And so I'm here to represent uh, the startup uh, perspective. I've been in multiple startups, uh, started my career at Hewlett Packard about 28 years ago. I spent a good amount of time at Sun Microsystems and Oracle. And so much of this is really thinking about how can we take advantage of, like Pat said, the opportunity that's in front of us. We have an opportunity where uh, the, their landscape is shifting, their fundamental shifts in technology, fundamental uh, generational shifts and use cases that are coming. And so how can we use this opportunity to, uh, um, to advance uh, American leadership in semiconductors? There's a role that startups play, and I wanna talk about that. I think the PCAS uh, subcommittee uh, really wanted me to spend a little bit of time on uh, the, the cost and time it takes to build a startup and how do we create a vibrant uh, um, startup ecosystem that allows us to innovate and keep up with uh, the, um, you know, the, the global, uh, the global competitors. So, so really uh, what we're seeing today is a generational shift. So just to put some context around this, um, from a computing perspective, we're uh, in the midst, or just in the beginning of this large generational transition. That's, you know, to the extent, uh, uh, to the scale of what we saw with the web in the, in the 90s and mobile computing in uh, the 2000s. And so what we're here, seeing here is that every company in every industry is starting to think about how AI is going to affect their business, right? And actually the reality is that um, the, the uh, implications that AI will have are, you know, are, are still to be determined. Like the internet and mobile, it's only in hindsight that we'll see kind of the massive changes that these shifts drove um, far beyond uh, what it originally was perceived as, you know, when when the web came, we thought putting a web page and uh, showcasing that we were on the uh, on the internet as a uh, as a website was enough. And yet, you know, entire economies have come in and um, created because of the capabilities of the internet. And AI is just starting to take uh, take hold across various types of industries, and has ultimately created some. Uh, new applications, the new ways of thinking about the problem, new end user demographics that we just hadn't uh, hadn't thought about before. And so it's going to create opportunities, it'll create challenges. So what does that mean specifically for the semiconductor industry? So uh, last year, the VCs invested nearly 10 billion in semiconductors in, uh, uh, in 2021. And so um, in comparison, having been in this industry for a few decades, um, the last 10, 15 years, we didn't see much VC investment in startups um, at all, right? It was uh, very sparse. And so uh, this represents a very significant shift in the venture capital community as far as what semiconductor uh, innovation can mean for the future of our economy. Um, within that, AI represents one of the main stimulus for why you know, semiconductors has come come back roaring in the uh, in the venture capital community. Uh, there is a, uh, a report that says, uh, "Hey, AI semiconductors could account for as much as 20% of all demand, and that's outpacing uh, existing uh, um, traditional semiconductor growth." Uh, and, and and really, it's ultimately 
focusing on what Priyanka just said about applications that can be more directly accelerated, more directly computed through uh, silicon that um, uh, is designed specifically for that task. Uh, and, and, and that's what's creating these, uh, the excitement around semiconductors uh, and venture capitalists, capitalists investing in, uh, in companies to go do that. AI is projected, and I think this is a McKinsey report where AI is projecting to add 15 trillion to the global economy over the next decade. And, and you know, it's hard to kind of wrap our brains around uh, those types of numbers, but what it does do is it does really think about the fact that um, it offers an unparalleled opportunity to process and use all this data that we have accumulated over the last 10, 20 years to develop insights and ultimately a competitive advantage. And I think industries are seeing this, companies within those industries are seeing this, and you see it deployed in ways that sometimes are obvious, but oftentimes are under the hood and not obvious and providing an incredible advantage to those people who are doing it. And for those who aren't, you know, they will, you know, they will very quickly find themselves behind. And so it's a transformative technology that I think we all need to think about uh, how, how to apply it to maintain our current competitive uh, advantage in a global scale, but also thinking about making sure that uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these technologies, these neural nets, which are secular in nature, can be applied across the broad range of applications in our, in our companies, in our industries. So... Uh, Silicon is going to be a big part of this. You know, we think that uh, uh, the ability to compute a lot of data with particular functions that are well suited for that type of uh, uh, application is going to be critical to uh, this transition that the world is going through and will continue to grow through, go through for the next 10 to 15 years. And startups play a role, right? Startups play a role in this. You know, this is one of those, those things where we're in, in, in the world of exploration, startups are well suited for it. Right, that you know, where the emergent application and emergent market has not reached a level to make material financial impact to the large companies. And the risk of success and risk of failures is higher than a, a, a typical project that big companies would embark on. That's a perfect role for startups to take, where you can take these new ideas that have a higher risk profile and yet are worthwhile exploring because the potential return being very big, that's where companies like ours can fit in to play those ideas out, play that innovation out, and some number of those will become vibrant and will become the, the cornerstone of technology for the next 10, 20 years. And so what does it take for us to actually create this vibrant startup ecosystem? Obviously a funding model, right? And we'll talk more about that. You know, comparing hardware and software funding, uh, there, it's a different magnitude because of all the costs that are associated with getting uh, startups to go. And so got to get market access, right? There's a lot that goes into trying to figure out a product market fit. And very often in a semiconductor ecosystem, the traditional procurement processes for the large companies to see if it's fit is very, uh, very well suited for larger companies that have a standing run rate, but for startups that are trying to get very quick access to see if there's a product market fit, that procurement process is something that has to, has to be thought through to make sure that you can test those ideas quickly, right? And rich ecosystem, Priyanka has talked about this already and Pat as well, um, where, you know, we have we, we, we cannot innovate everywhere. We need to leverage partners and leverage uh, um, technology that's available in the, open, uh, uh, in the open market. And so having that ecosystem that allows us to use standards, standards to actually both in quickly and then allow us to put the innovative ideas in one place. I think that's, uh, 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 that's a, a critical aspect of it. And then certainly talent, you know, the, you know the, uh, there is a, a talent shortage today. We continue to see this uh, uh, as, as a critical area that we gotta, we have to go invest in and, and, uh, uh, and work harder to, uh, um, to grow. And so this is where I really want to spend much of the time. If I just draw this curve for you today, the blue line, is effectively the amount of investment that startups have to put in before they made a, make a single dollar, right? Unlike larger companies that have a steady revenue run rate um, and you, you, you can plan on future roadmap items as part of the revenue run rate, startups are starting for zero, right? And so from hiring talent to 
building a technology infrastructure that where that's you know a five nanometer or three nanometer technology and deciding on chiplet uh, technology and various uh, uh, IP uh, IP decisions that have to be made for the chip design those all have to be done prior to even beginning the design of the chip and the chip development itself depending on the application can take anywhere between six months to 18 months until you get to a first article and tape out. Once you have tape out, then we have this process, depending again on the technology node that we're going into, you may have access uh, to, to first articles, first articles back from a fab within say four months to as, as long as say eight to nine months, depending on which, uh, which technology node you're in. And then you have the prototypes that allow you to then you know, either build your own systems yourself or work with a system developer to partner to create those uh, complete systems and then software development can, can be built on top. And so adding all of that time, that could be anywhere between two to three to as long as four years before you get the first set of articles with software developed that the customer can do a POC. And so the area under that curve is all cash that has to be raised and cash that has to be uh, funded through a uh, venture or other ways until you can begin a commercial conversation, right? Where if you think about why the software startups are able to go much, much faster, the delay, there isn't as much delay in actually getting access to technology or uh, the, 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 the timeline for fab and having to build systems and having to ramp up systems. Those are the things that are all part of the cost and why it takes so much to actually uh, um, um, get, get uh, chip startups going. And one of the questions the subcommittee asked was, well, how much does it cost? Well, you know, it's hard to say, it depends sometimes on what application you're focusing on, but you know, my, my rule of thumb is you know, typically in a, a chip company, make, it takes as much as $100 million for you to get to the point where you can sustain yourself in some cases, a lot more, some cases, uh, maybe a little bit less. It's probably not significantly less than that just because of the time it takes for us to get through the cycle and that entire time you're burning cash because the teams are there and all the cost keeps accumulating. The green line here is when you actually generate revenue, that entire time until you get to the POC, you're not actually able to monetize uh, the, the, the articles that you're building because you're just not there yet. There is no software running it. And so you can actually demonstrate the capabilities of the device. Right. So once we get into a customer POC, you can start doing arrangements where you can start testing them. But even then, it takes going through this a few times before a customer feel com feels comfortable that this device I can devote the de deploy in production and get into volume production, which is when you see that crossover. All right. So ultimately, that's kind of what, what we need to do that as a uh, as a, uh, uh, a country thinking about how do we create a more vibrant uh, ecosystem for startups. How do we actually get more startups, generating more ideas and finding more innovative products that we can actually deploy? It's all about lowering the cost uh, on the blue side, how do we get access to technology and, and, and um, um, uh, fabs and things like that are a lower cost. And then also how to bring in the timeline for generating revenue. Right. And so I think it's all about kind of making sure that we can get those articles quickly out to try and figure out if there's a product market fit and allowing startups to actually go in through a path that's faster where the open bid traditional procurement going through all of the contractual agreements that typically is done for large scale procurement of uh, infrastructure is much longer than uh, what startups typically need in order to iterate and see if there is a commercial product market fit for a particular idea and a particular uh, a task that customers want to do. So I'll just give you a quick uh, rundown of what we ended up, the path we ended up doing for Samba Nova. You know, so this is a, a company that was really anchored around some innovation that was being done uh, out of Stanford University. This, uh, my co-founders, two Stanford professors have been thinking about this idea for a while and really partnering with DARPA and DARPA funded that research. And this is again, part of how do we actually reduce that cost of innovation and having uh, the government really collaborate with us to figure out is there, is there a there there, right? And then taking that some of those ideas as we built 
the product, then collaborating with national labs and collab collaborating with the Department of Energy to actually deploy them in a commercial way. And so that was our way of actually trying to take these ideas and lowering some of the costs and bringing the integration uh, faster to, to, to get to uh, a commercial place to help reduce that area under the curve where the startups have to go and raise that cash from venture capitalists, which over time is harder and harder to uh, um, do if you aren't showing a revenue trajectory. So summing over, we started in 2017, so it's about five years now. We are in the Series D company. We've raised about uh, a little over a billion dollars at five billion valuation. And so we're a company that's about 500 people. Uh, seems like a, a lot for a startup, and yet relative to startup uh, start, uh, for uh, semiconductor companies, that's more or less what it takes to build these uh, cutting edge uh, technology companies. And uh, our technique was also bringing in partners and bringing in you know, uh, um, 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 you know, uh, companies like uh, Arts uh, Company that you've talked soon about. You know, getting getting infrastructure from there, and then have, getting help from Pat and 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 others to to figure out how to actually uh, help us with some aspects of the technology that we cannot build ourselves to accelerate. You know, bringing our piece of technology that's innovative into a broader ecosystem, and then taking that and then you know, and building a lot of the software to accelerate people's ability to make use of the technology. So that's my quick summary on uh, what I think you know, uh, we, we could do. The uh, the um, um, asks here, I think standards are really important to allow us to quickly uh, use use uh, uh, open market technology. I think having access to IP, I think, is really important. We do we use that a lot. Having access to uh, cutting edge fabs at a uh, a cost that's proportional to what startups can handle, and having ultimately access to uh, commercial endpoints to do a very fast. Uh, um, um, uh, product market fit is ultimately uh, a crucial, crucial to startups' ability to show that they can actually stand on their own. Okay, thank you very much. Very informative, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on next to Art. Okay, let me uh, share my screen. You should be seeing something at this point in time. Uh, yes, we are. Well, first, uh, thank you for having me here. It's a privilege uh, to speak to you about a topic that is absolutely essential because if you look at semiconductors, uh, the slides are not quite moving here yet. Here we go. Uh, if you look at semiconductors, they are at the center of the next evolution for mankind. It's that big a theme. Now, of course, uh, over the years, we brought about uh, computation, connectivity, and mobility. And here is the age of making everything smart. And we certainly need a lot of smarts in the world. And we've heard the theme already from uh, Rodrigo, which is that it is really the intersection of big data and AI that is now coming to fruition. And the notion of making many smarts, uh, things smart is visible already. But from my perspective, I think the big opportunity is the scientific revolution that is necessary for us to handle the planet, to understand hu humanity and biology, to uh, reset the, the infrastructure that we live in and transform every vertical. And so chips are essential because they are the compute engines. They have to be optimized uh, for this task. And the uh, supply chain is actually simple to understand, but complex to execute. It consists of design followed by manufacturing, assembly and test, often just referred to as uh, manufacturing. And each one of those has some extremely deep um, uh, disciplines supporting them. EDA, electronic design automation, has been there from the start to help uh, automate design, as the term says, supported by the reuse of big IP blocks. These are pieces of design that you can reuse for efficiency or for uh, uh, differentiation that you otherwise may not have. The other area that is absolutely crucial in that is the alignment between the software that runs on top of the hardware for the hardware or write the software so that it can use the hardware. In a similar way, equipment and materials are very uh, uh, related. But even in manufacturing, uh, EDA is now becoming more and more relevant as one wants to develop new approaches on the computer rather than by the experimentation in the fab, which is very lengthy and expensive. And so many advances really rely at the end of the day on human talent. And we've heard it now already three times. So probably it's an area that you have to pay attention to which is that the great opportunity has also brought about a great shortage. And this is especially true in the United States. And so 
the needs to invest in this area is absolutely uh, essential going forward. Now, it's important to understand what the present status is in the, in the U.S., because the U.S. is actually in a very strong position. And if you look here at the, the market shares in the different disciplines, you can readily see that EDA, IP, logic design, uh, manufacturing equipment are in the upper, uh, upper half or close to it and have a lot of impact on what we do. And of course, you can see also the areas that need uh, further investment if one wants independence. But the reality is we are globally very in the, in, uh, dependent right now. The uh, investments in the US though have been absolutely uh, booming. And the, uh, uh, this is very encouraging because in order to get the level of market shares that you see, for example, in EDA and IP, re uh, requires an enormous amount of investment. Speaking uh, for Synopsys, we have been probably in excess of 32% for 35 years to stay at the state of the art. But this is also one of the things that distinguishes the US. If you look at chip design, 18% uh, of revenue goes into R&D. And actually, Pat mentions that uh, he excels with 20% for a very large company, which is fantastic. But we've also seen that these numbers have increased substantially recently, meaning people see the opportunity to invest for future opportunities. And then there's a whole new cast of characters, new entrants, hyperscalers. And as we heard from uh, Rodrigo, there's been a substantial investment increase in VC funding in the US for, uh, for semiconductors. Now, this is also true in the rest of the world, and so we'll need to continue to pay attention. So and also another way of saying, hey, the race is absolutely on. And uh, you're all familiar with Moore's Law. Here somewhat overstated is the fact that after you know, 45 years or so of exponential, it is not quite growing as fast, but the advances are actually astounding still. And we'll continue to, uh, to uh, follow this trend. Uh, and are fundamentally driven from the start by performance, area, and power, PPA often referred as that. What we see, though, is truly an inflection point to what uh, we would like to call SysMore, so systemic complexity, but with a Moore's Law exponential ambition. And it's characterized by uh, a set of problems that have to do with the intersection of many different disciplines. And I'd like to highlight multi-die as the, the way to get dramatically more transistors, but using multiple chips. And with it comes system optimization, which is the intersection between the software world and hardware. And to execute on this, we are actually pledging a thousand uh, X an increase in designer productivity, which is substantial. And so the only fly in the ointment is, hey, this requires uh, some immense uh, amount of talent. And so talent, talent, at the end of the day, this is a, a brain-oriented uh, uh, field. So you asked the question, what can EDA do and what should uh, the US do? Well, there are many things. And for starters, we eat in our own restaurant in that we use now AI to uh, drive entire design flows forward. And the advances in the last two years have just been fantastic. We see about a three to five X uh, improvement in time to results with very good technical results as well. Secondly, investing uh, around multi-die is actually fundamental EDA because everything has to do with how you connect those things, how do you avoid thermal issues, how do you bring proximity, how you do split it into different chips. Third, system virtualization. Some people calling it uh, call it digital twinning, which is build a model of how it will work before it is actually being built, meaning the chips run the software on chips that don't exist yet. The same, by the way, applies increasingly to manufacturing virtualization. To what extent can one model not only new technologies, but also the capacity and the yield and optimize for that? And lastly, interestingly enough, EDA is now available in SaaS, meaning uh, you know, software as a service, meaning that for startups, you don't have to necessarily build the entire compute infrastructure, have the IT team, but can actually run the tools on, uh, on the internet uh, in a pay-per-use model. This is also important for large companies because you may have a task that you run on 100 computers, but what if you could have 10,000 computers for just a week? Could that change the way you look at your scheduling? So there are many, many advances, and I would say we are as innovative as we were in the early days. It feels absolutely the same in terms of breakthroughs. 
What can the government do? Well, the first thing is to realize how strong the semiconductor industry in the US actually is. Don't underestimate what we can do. And the first thing therefore is to protect it, protect the innovation, protect the intellectual property, but also make sure that we have access to the global markets in order to get the funding necessary to continue at this clip and access just as importantly to the global talent available. Talking about talent, and uh, Priyanka had some very good ideas, and I like the notion that it has to be exciting. Well, one of the things that makes things exciting is also if it's being paid for. And there's a lot of students that cannot afford to go into a master's degree, and it takes a master's degree. This is, this is a field of tech deep. You need to learn things. And so what we're propos proposing here is funding for about 7,500 master degrees uh, per year for the next five years, probably in 20 universities and maybe some uh, research hubs, some private uh, uh, public funding for the top students. And by the way, notice for every graduate, make sure we staple a visa and work permit for the international ones. Makes no sense to educate people to then send them to become competitors uh, somewhere else. Secondly, boost engineering skill development by having the most advanced tools and IP box available. With other words, at the master's level, design with the state of the art. And last but not least, we need to rebuild uh, the US as a magnet for talent. The US uh, uh, in, uh, economic, uh, uh, in university system is still the best in the world. That magnet cannot be held up by blocking the entry of international talent by a cap on, on uh, green cards. That must be uh, separated from the other immigration issues. Lastly, uh, this was mentioned already a number of times, orchestrating ecosystems where there's intersection. And I think that the notion of uh, multi-die, multi-chip is a very good forward-looking notion that will become increasingly important. It's already happening in the most advanced companies and it does require some orchestration. And then there's a plethora of topics. Uh, some again were mentioned, ultra low power, low energy, uh, high performance computing sounds like an oxymoron, but it's, it's uh, real research, silicon photonics and many others. Lastly, I'd like to, to give just one more perspective, which is that national competitiveness is absolutely essential, but so is global leadership. They go hand in hand. And so to be sustainable, an effort like investing in semiconductor needs to be an umbrella of something that is actually meaningful to mankind. And if you buy into that, we can learn from the, the 1960s where the put a man on the moon was stated as part of future of earth of mankind. It was important from a long range point of view and it required a national commitment. The national commitment was made, the funding had enormous impact, including by the way, on semiconductor technology. Well, there's no doubt that we're facing a similar opportunity or challenge, a mission that's meaningful to mankind and that is to avoid the climate catastrophe. And so we need to understand what our role can be in that. The semiconductors can now enable the very massive breakthroughs in science, technology, and engineering that will be necessary in order to get there on time. The race is on just as much for mankind as it is in semiconductors. If we can align those two, we've given a meaning that actually uh, equates to world leadership. And I think that's the objective of PCAST. Thank you very much. Okay, it's very profound art, thank you. And uh, finally, we'll turn it over to John before we open it up to discussion. John? Thank you, Maria. And um, it is a great honor to be here um, uh, speaking to this P PCAST group. Uh, I head the uh, Semiconductor Industry Association. We're, we're based here in Washington, D.C., and we represent 98% of the U.S. Uh, chip industry and two-thirds of the global industry. Uh, you've already heard some really great, thoughtful perspectives from the previous panelists. I, I, I'd like to provide a higher-level uh, industry-wide response to the queries uh, posted by PCAST, your group. Um, uh, you've already heard there are many challenges facing our industry today, both short term and long term. Chief among them are the decline in onshore uh, fabrication capacity. Pat spoke uh, well to that. 
gaps and vulnerabilities in the supply chain, uh, which the pandemic have, have both accentuated and accelerated. Challenges to US technology leadership uh, and weaknesses in key capabilities like prototyping uh, and workforce deficiencies, which Art and pretty much everyone here has talk, talked about across the entire spectrum, both in terms of highly educated scientists and engineers, as well as technicians and construction workers. But we have a rare opportunity to address these challenges and pave the way for continued American leadership in uh, chip innovation, design, and manufacturing. There's pending piece of legislation under consideration, the CHIPS Act and an investment tax credit known as the FABS Act. These are a critical part of the solution. Your recommendations to the president will be key in this context and could not be coming at a more pivotal time for our industry and our country. To put a couple numbers around the scale of the challenge we face, uh, there are there's a pressing need for new manufacturing capacity at the leading and trailing edge. The U.S. accounted for 37% of modern commercial chip capacity in the 1990s, and today that's down to a mere 12%. Weaknesses in the supply chain have become apparent and in many cases accelerated during the COVID era. The, chip, the global chip shortage has impacted virtually all parts of the economy, automotive, medical devices, manufacturing, consumer products, as well as our defense industrial base. If there's a silver lining here, it's that the pandemic and shortage has significantly increased awareness, both among policymakers here in Washington and the general public on the centrality of chips. Regarding the workforce pipeline, deficiencies here have always been challenging and are projected to grow even more serious. By our analysis, 42,000 additional new jobs will be required directly in the semiconductor industry in the next half decade and 238,000 in adjacent and supporting sectors. Without action, we will not be in a position to grow and innovate as an industry in a fashion that will lock in our leadership. This is something uh, Art touched on. There is a virtuous cycle between R&D, workforce, and innovation. Investments, both public and private, in R&D help create the programs in universities and research institutions that attract the talent that powers the ideas and innovation that is the lifeblood of our industry. Our R&D commitments, ambitions, have everything to do with our ability to, to develop talent. Importantly, we must understand we are not alone as a nation in wanting to support semiconductor manufacturing design and research. Other nations, have already pa passed their own versions of the CHIP CHIPS Act. The train is leaving the station and we're standing on the platform watching that happen. We are fortunate, however, that bipartisan action is underway in both the House and Senate to address these challenges and provide new opportunities for US technology competitiveness. And we're hopeful funding is on the way in the near term. As you know, the CHIPS Act falls in two general categories. It will, it will provide 39 billion in grants for manufacturing incentives to build more chips in the US. And then there's the 13 billion for R&D and more specifically, the lab to fab technology transfer process. For an, for an R&D and innovation, from an R&D uh, innovation leadership perspective, the most critical part of the CHIPS Act is establishment of the NSTC and the packaging program. <clears throat> the most pressing questions for us and government uh, for both efforts are naturally what should they do and how should they be structured? The greatest need for support is bridging the lab to fab gap sometimes called the valley of death. To illustrate this, I would like to draw your attention to our slide uh, uh, showing the current support for technologies at different levels of technology re readiness. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see from basic research to applied R&D, to prototyping, to piloting, to scaling and production. Our nation is already the global leader for early stage R&D, supported by many excellent government funding agencies and by our private sector. The prototyping and piloting, piloting stages of technology development are where the majority of the NSTC and packaging program activity should be focused 
represented by the light green line on the slide. This is the big nut we need to crack. <clears throat> Development is needed across the full computation stack. This means we need innovation in advanced materials and structures, novel devices and circuits, architectures that leverage these advances, and finally software and algorithms that make use of the full set of computing innovation. Within this, within this full set of areas, research must address technology for logic and memory, but also for analog and RF electronics, because all of these subsectors are critical to our economy and national security in different ways. Advances in packaging and test will be critical to invest in, particularly uh, heterogeneous uh, integration for edge devices and cloud infrastructure advanced testing capabilities with increased automation and high density, high speed interconnects. Finally, development of automated design tools for both chips and packaging will, will be essential to retain global semiconductor leadership. It's a big complex ecosystem. All parts of it need attention, need tending. There have been plenty of good suggestions on for how, to, how the NSTC and packaging programs should be structured and governed. We'd like to offer a few points here. The governance of the NSTC and packaging program must be industry-led. This is the only way to ensure successful technology transfer to the, to the commercial sector. The, the two efforts should be very closely aligned or if permitted by legislation, combined entirely. The needs of semiconductor manufacturing and packaging are too interconnected to be treated separately. Funding should also be carefully and thoughtfully balanced between standing up new infrastructure and upgrading existing infrastructure. There are great existing facilities that can and should be leveraged, but to save costs and both to save costs and get things up and running quickly. But we may also want to consider some new facilities as they are warranted. In addition, at least some degree of centralization should be required for scaled piloting to be feasible. Too much diffusion of resources risks leaving us with an anemic meandering result. If it will be important, it will be an important balancing act to get right. And we must effectively address collaboration. The NSTC and packaging program will only, only really make sense with substantial collaboration. The pipeline of early stage technologies that will need the NSTC TC and packaging program to help them scale up will come from research agencies and organizations like NSF, DOE, DARPA, Semiconductor Research Corporation, the Albany, the Albany Nanotech Complex, national labs and other federal research centers and universities. It will be important to orchestrate collaboration among these various stakeholders with industry. But the biggest thing here is to be ambitious and to keep our eyes on the prize, the targeted objective, to help bridge the valley of death so innovative technologies can more easily make their way to commercial relevance. In addition, parallel to these domestic collaboration efforts is the need for substantial international collaboration. This should include non-US companies from our allies and international partners and organizations like IMEG and CEA Leti. There is important innovation going on overseas that we, we should leverage. To avoid redundancies and drive stronger innovation when determining priorities, the investments made by the NSTC and packaging program should factor in investments made by other governments toward boosting R&D and improving the supply chain. The CHIPS Act rests on two pillars, incentives for manufacturing and incentives for research. We need to do both. The potential value of a successful NSTC and packaging program cannot be overstated couple of final points. The effort will only the, the effort will not only address the largest weak links of the present semiconductor technology pipeline, crossing the valley of death and improving our advanced packaging capabilities, but also it will serve as a major asset in workforce training and development in our sector. This is key. I should also underscore the effort must place a significant focus on assisting semiconductor startups by providing much needed capacity for prototyping and piloting of their innovative designs and technologies. In addition, I wanna point out the FABS Act task, tax credit 
with a design component, but also be of great assistance to startups, which are, of course, almost entirely in the design side of the equation. Thank you again for including SIA in this session, and I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you, John. Um, what a, an outstanding uh, set of comments by our speakers today. So we have, uh, we have uh, a lot of time for questions. Uh, we've got uh, until uh, nearly four o'clock. So, and not surprisingly, um, there's a lot of interest by the PCAS members already. I'll start with the first question to, um, to Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo, that, uh, that figure that you showed that um, indicated the, all the steps that had to be taken, you know, before um, a final product could be realized. I mean, your, uh, your first point, uh, uh, waypoint on that was Stanford University, which has state-of-the-art tools um, uh, for training and to start you off. What would be the challenge if somebody wanted to, wanting to take a path like the one that you took, what would the additional complexity be um, coming from a university that, that didn't have those kinds of resources associated with them? Uh, how much more difficult would it be or would it even be possible at all? So if you could uh, address that. One of the things that we encountered very early in the idea, what the research, research idea started at Stanford um, and there were, there were a lot of really good data points that we got around the technology and why this type of data flow technology is useful for applications such as AI. But as you went down into the idea of implementing commercial grade, production grade products that can be actually sold into critical real life environments, uh, it did require having a team that had built and developed that technology for those cases because you're moving this technology from research, which is really about proof of the key concept to things like availability, reliability, security, power, all the things that have to be considered as you create this technology for broad production and broad, broad consumption. And so having a team, um, which I think everybody on the, uh, that, that has represented so far that has that talent of actually taking technology, deploying in production, deploying in volume in places where people come in and say, yes, I took this technology, it runs, it runs reliably, it runs securely. I can put not one developer on it, but thousands of users on it, and it stands that robustness. That's a challenge, right? And so it's not, I think that the, it was said earlier today where uh, the research is really important, the ability to manufacture is really important, but the ability to integrate into commercial grade solutions that are able to get deployed in production for large sets of people for mission critical applications where it has to be secure, there's another skill set that's required in order to integrate all of those and deploy in production. Okay, thank you. Um, Ash Carter, you're first up. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks very much to the speakers. These were excellent presentations and certainly a really important topic. Um, Two uh, questions, if I may. The first is we have a number of competitors in this area, um, uh, Korea, Taiwan, um, Europe in the benign category. So I'm gonna focus on the less benign competitor, namely China. And um, I think, Pat, this may be for you and art, uh, but I'll, I'll let you volunteer. Um, it, how would you compare their, as best we understand them now, statist plans to our aspirations that we've been describing here uh, with our various pieces of legislation and so forth in terms of their nature and their scale? Um, are they in the same ballpark as us or uh, are they different? And second, uh, if you would uh, address the question of the government, I saw one of the presentations, maybe this is John for John, the government as an early adopter, a cost insensitive early adopter, uh, has been as important as the government as an R&D funder. In this field, can you say something, John, about uh, the government as an early adopter of the 
the very newest and priciest, but also highest performer performing technology. Sure, let me, uh, I'll start and then John can jump in to follow. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, let me, maybe two different dimensions of uh, China, right? You know, one is in terms of their uh, technology capabilities, you know, generally, you know, they're at about 14 nanometers, right? It's their most advanced capabilities uh, today, right? And it's just sort of, you know, getting there at that point, you know, and, and now, uh, you know, if you look at TSMC, you know, they're, uh, you know, at four nanometers, you know, we're at seven nanometers. By 2024, we expect that we'll be, you know, ramping our three and our 28 uh, technologies up right about where TSMC is at that point in time. But given uh, export policies uh, that, you know, are generally accepted in the world, I think it's very important that we get alignment of our, you know, friendlies, as you call it, right? You know, uh, you know Europe and uh, uh, Japan in particular, where these are, you know, I think there's great opportunity to, you know, create an increasing gap in terms of the leading edge technology capabilities uh, that we have in place. And we would emphasize, you know, that those export policies, I think, get to be very critical, uh, Ash. But the second thing is, is that if you look at capacity, China has made extraordinary investments and substantial subsidies uh, against their industry. And if you look at landed equipment, which is a future indicator of capacity, uh, last, I think the number is, and John may have this off his head, about 32, 33% of capacity landed in China, right, as measured by equipment uh, in the last year. And in contrast, I think about 8% landed on US soil. You know, and that's why the manufacturing element of the CHIPS Act is so incredible, incredibly important, because today we're at about 12% of output. But if we only landed about 8% of equipment, that means the 12 is going down over time. So I would say we have lost ground in terms of capacity. And semiconductors is a capacity gain, because when you're manufacturing, you're constantly, it's not like you put something into manufacturing and leave it go, right? Essentially, the first two to three years of a product and a new technology is continuing R&D and refinement, and that R&D folds over into the next generation. This is a capacity game. So I think we are at a very precarious point uh, in that, that if you don't begin to reverse this trend and now, right, you know, combined with strong export uh, policies, you know, I believe the industry is at risk of losing critical mass, right, of manufacturing and R&D of leading edge technology on American soil. Uh, then I, I will make a comment a bit on the second, the second part uh, as well. You know, generally, um, you know, the uh, requirements of U.S. government as a leading buyer, you know, generally, you know, this, this has in many cases been a great example in the past. I don't think it is uh, the case for semiconductors in the future. You know, generally, the volumes, the capacities, et cetera, are so small compared to the R&D and capex requirements required for government that essentially, you know, the government needs now are a trailing indicator, not a leading indicator of the use of technology. Now, one of the things that we've been suggesting, and we're part of the ramp C program, the ship programs, the ramp programs that are underway, is that we have to close the gap. You know, when every new FAM module is $10 billion, it has to be backed up by, you know, many billions of dollars of R&D that is a yearly investment. You know, I'm expecting that, uh, you know, my capital investment is over $30 billion per year uh, going forward. This is an extraordinary, you know, channel of investment that just every year is going forward. We have to build an effective sidecar for U.S. government, you know, for defense and intelligence purposes. You cannot replicate you know, that train, right? We have to bridge those two worlds together. And on many of the more advanced technology requirements, research efforts, you know, that's where I see things like NSTC being so powerful, right? Keep that R&D engine, keep the, you know, the talent engine and uh, keep the startup engine alive and well. And I do, and maybe one last comment on this is, you know, I'm a deep believer in rebuilding, I'll call it the, the Moses shuttle for the industry on U.S. soil that was, you know, Right, Barry, and we've started some shuttle programs, foundry programs, et cetera. And I think that needs to become a broad capability for uh, universities uh, across uh, American soil. You know, we've started some of those programs as we're building our foundry capabilities. 
And I would, I would hope to see that become an at-scale program for semiconductor research, university programs, and startup programs. Thank you. Uh, Paula Hammond. Yes, thank you for that uh, incredible uh, set of presentations. I have a question about manufacturing, which may be relevant uh, for Art and John and uh, perhaps uh, Pat, which is uh, how were, were, were companies able to come together and determine the standards needed for shared facilities, especially as uh, we look at an industry in which the, the uh, scale at which you're working is very different um, and, and changing rapidly. Uh, so I'm wondering how that collaboration, how that agreement was reached. And once shared facilities are developed, what determines who gets to use these scale facilities and at what cost? How do we balance the new startups that may not have the same amount of funding? Uh, I'm just curious about how that is handled. You're talking about manufacturing uh, capacity. Uh, Man manufacturing right? capacity and, and infrastructure that is uh, generated through uh, the CHIPS Act, for example. Well, uh, you know, Pat is better <laughs> positioned to answer that, but I can comment on one thing, which is how, how do these things work in reality today? Well, any of the foundries, those are the big manufacturing centers that, that uh, the industry relies on, has a program to let startups or small companies participate and fabricate chips. And typically they put chips from different companies on the same wafer, which is these, these sets of uh, if you a hundred or thousand uh, chips. And, and uh, these wafers go into production, let's say once a quarter, and then you can be on one of those wafers but you have to convince the foundry that actually it makes sense to put your stuff there by virtue of being competent, by virtue of passing in a large number of EDA tests, is the chip actually likely to work? And these tests are administered by us and the foundry to make sure that there's correctness, otherwise it's a waste of, of time. And then you have to also uh, convince the foundry that, hey, there's a business opportunity here and not a lot of work with, with no long-term volume because they, they don't make any money on those. And when um, uh, Pat was mentioning the MOSES program, that used to be done by the government at much smaller scale, I wanna say 25 years or so ago, at which point in time, it was, things were simpler. With, with the big foundries, you have to be at uh, you know, state of the art verification and, and a sign off, otherwise they will not let you onto any of their wafers. But it's a program that's very, very effective and a lot of startups, that's how they get the first chips back. Yeah, and maybe I'll just uh, a, a couple of comments. You know, generally, you know, commercial foundry, you know, of which we're, you know, building up our capabilities and then you know, there's a commercial process associated with that, Paula, right? You know, where, right, you know, uh, you know, often associated with what the price per wafer is. Sometimes there's, you know, prepaid commitments associated uh, with it. Um, and, uh, you know, against that, I'll just say commercial terms rule. But I think from a startup and a university perspective, you know, we do need to have a very different, I'll say, you know, uh, a sheet uh, that's available terms and services, right? And typically it's run as a quarterly kind of shuttle program where you get on the bus every quarter, right? There are so many slots available to different universities. So much uh, of that shared sh shuttle was providing those test chips. And as Art said, a lot of that front end now is dictated by the EDA processes, where I think that we could you know, increasingly set up a better and better program in that regard to facilitate, I'll say, more slots. And as we build up our foundry offerings uh, to the industry, you know, I expect that we'll be you know, becoming more and more of that. Some of those could be for defense purposes, small you know, slots. Some of those could be uh, for academic and clearly some of it for uh, startup programs. And we fully expect that that'll be an area that will be in conjunction with universities and government will be building out as part of our foundry offerings. By, by the way, Paula, uh, in many parts of the world, uh, governments actually invest in making certain parts, uh, parts of the infrastructure available, uh, typically in universities, in some cases in sort of uh, hub research uh, centers or so-called incubation uh, centers. 
And so if you take the European Union, for example, with companies such as with us, we, we have a, tra a, a business transaction with them and a, a modus operandi where we will then support a number of universities that the EU decided uh, to fund. And that has actually worked very well. There's only marginal cases where if you know commercial companies start to do design at the university because it's free, yeah, that's of course uh, you know a little tricky. And incubation centers has have a little bit that nature because they're incubating to get to to pass. What was it? The valley of death that that John was talking about. But these mechanisms exist. I think they're 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 less in the U.S. in that sense. Although we have many relationships with with universities, because the U.S. has had less of a uh, uh, national roadmap for semiconductors because private industry was actually you know, cranking pretty well. Can I just jump in with a couple of things, uh, just supplementing what Art, Art and Pat, Pat said. Um, I, I, I'm quite sure the Commerce Department, which is going to administer the NSTC, is thinking about this and wants to, wants to run the program in a way that uh, creates more opportunities for startups uh, in, 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 in the fabs. And just returning to Asha's first couple of questions um, um, about China's role here. Uh, I, I couldn't be more excited with what's happening with, with the chips and fabs and NSTC because it's a strong affirmative agenda. And I, I strongly feel that our industry's success is gonna be far more defined by our ability to pedal faster, to pursue an affirmative agenda than all the other, other defensive mechanisms to, to deal with China. So this is, a, this is a seismic shift for the US government and we are absolutely heading in the right direction. Um, and the question about uh, a first adapter, um, Pat's absolutely right. Uh, it, the, 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 the environment has changed right now. Uh, our industry sells about 1% of our units into the defense industry here, which of course is a huge shift from the days of the the, the lunar landings and things like that. But there's an enormous role here for the US government. And that is, you know, our companies are, are amazing innovators and fierce competitors, but there's certain pre-competitive basic research where government can play a very critical role to bring all of us together to, to, to get innovation. And that's, that, that's what underlies the, uh, the uh, NSTC. Thank you. Uh Dan Arvizu. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the presentations were outstanding. Gosh, what, what uh, very inspiring with all the new things that I think that are, that are coming down the pike. Uh, Maria kind of, uh, uh, I think, touched on the, the first question I have. We have two questions. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. The first question has to do with, with um, especially minority serving, you know, universities and those that don't have an infrastructure that goes along with, uh, you know, having the capability to really integrate nicely into one of these existing platforms. And so the real question has to do with how can, you know, what kinds of processes, I, I do like the EDA uh, process because it now opens up that ecosystem for uh, other pieces. And, and maybe that's, that's a place to be. So that's the first question. Second question is uh, just kind of drawing from history a little bit. Um, what, what did we learn from Semitech that might be useful in, uh, in maybe helping to decide how we do NSTC you know, more, uh, you know, uh, with, with more modern kind of uh, objectives to go with it. So I'd be, I'd be curious on your perspectives um, on that. And anyone can answer those two, either one of those two questions. I can take a stab at the university infrastructure and what it is, what is needed for, you know, minority institutions and universities. So uh, you're absolutely right. There is a higher barrier to entry, but as Art said, uh, it is not in, insurmountable. Uh, even as of now, uh, EDA tool access is very widespread and there are good programs that exist to bring up both the tool access as well as computing infrastructure at all U.S. universities. It should be very feasible to do that. I think the bigger issue is um, talent to actually teach, right? So you have to invest in hiring faculty who are motivated uh, to teach uh, uh, such curricula at these universities and give them the ability to collaborate with other uh, universities that already have such programs going in order to uh, circumvent these barriers. 
right? So creating hiring faculty and allowing them to freely collaborate is going to be very important, but uh, certainly something that, that can be accomplished with the talent that we have. That's a great answer. Thank you. Anybody want to take on Symatech? Well, Semotech was a little bit before right. my time, but I, th I think there's a lesson in Semotech, and it's the same lesson we should have today, which is in this field, you never win by slowing somebody else down. You only win by accelerating yourself. And, and I think uh, uh, John said it in a different way, don't be defensive, be offensive, and, and be international. We, we should watch out to find the right balance between wanting to be leaders in technology in the US and having the right ingredients, but realizing that there are some ingredients in other countries that cannot be duplicated in any short number of years. And so strong alliances is absolutely uh, essential in that. And also realize that the overall economic flow of return needs to come from the whole world to support this. And so that is, that is the gray zone balance to find that you have, have to find. But uh, underneath all of that, and, and that is sort of the, 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 the lesson out of China is their strength started by investing in STEM, by focusing universities on STEM and for 25 years, cranking out more engineers and lawyers, not, not to put down lawyers, but, but there's some other countries where it's the opposite. With other words, you know, th th that flow is now coming to fruition and uh, manifests itself in areas where I'm actually as Pat. China has a long time to catch up on a number of things, but in new areas such as AI, they do a, a fair battle and I'm sure Rodrigo can comment to that. Uh, and so the race is on, the race is on. You don't slow the other guy's car, accelerate your own car. And maybe, maybe if I might pile on a couple of other comments to Summit Tech. Summit Tech was a place, right? If you recall, and you know, in some cases it became competitive with other industry players. You know, one of our clear recommendations is, is that uh, NSTC be structured as a set of hubs that are highly integrated with industry uh, players to not create that. And you know, for instance, we suggest you know we would actually house the lithographic. Uh, you know, research hub for NSTC. Why? Because I'm putting tens of these half a billion dollar machines in place already, establishing, you know, the community, ASML and others coming around us already. So you know, we do think it should be a more distributed and more co-resident uh, with the uh, substantial investments of the uh, commercial uh, entities. You know, but I do think there's many things that uh, if we replicated aspects of Semitech, you know, we'd be, we would be helping ourselves. And I think there's good learnings to make sure that we you know, leverage there. I'd also emphasize, uh, maybe put a different color on art second point um, and uh, not competing with uh, some of the efforts worldwide. I would point out that the US, Europe and Japan essentially are responsible for 100% of the innovation going on in semiconductors. And, you know, the strong aligned policies with uh, Europeans and uh, Japan, something that, uh, for instance, with Europe was kicked off by the formation of the TTC uh, and the Trade and Technology Council. You know, we, we have the opportunity to align these interests very effectively uh, for us. And uh, there's a, a willingness in the part of both Europe and Japan. And while I strongly believe that uh, NSTC should be governed by US entities only, I think participation should clearly be inclusive of uh, these globally strong uh, forces from our uh, allies and friends globally. Thank you. Laura Green. Uh, thank you for a truly extraordinary set of talks and they were so complimentary and I learned a great deal. Um, I wanted, I think this is for Pat and maybe Art, but um, <clears throat> we lost more than $20 billion a year permanent magnet industry mostly because of supply chain and not just of critical elements. And also given that Pat said, I love that statement, um, uh, you know, as long as the, you know, as long as the periodic table is not exhausted, Moore's law is still alive and well. Now, our pointed out some interesting things about supply chain was that the US only had about 10% of the market share of the materials themselves. So I was wondering if uh, the materials, uh, procuring and uh, refining of materials shouldn't come more into the US 
we used to do a lot of mining and uh, and uh, purifying of materials, and we don't do very much of that anymore. Do you think that should be a part of this effort? Well, I think it's a related uh, effort, and uh, materials, you know, uh, you know, the things that we're dependent on. Right, are of much smaller scale. When you think about the materials that uh, we require, you know, it's not like big lithium mines and so on that are essential. But I think these are very related topics, Laura. And I do think we want to make sure that uh, the supply chains all the way through materials are either in the U.S. or in U.S. friendlies. Right, and you know, a country like Australia has a great history of mining and refining as well. And, you know, I think there's opportunity to, again, leverage our allies in a very effective way. And again, we see them rising up. I do think that, uh, as I commented in my initial remarks, that uh, this is a historic moment for the supply chain. You know, and the Shanghai shutdowns have essentially caused the industry very rapidly, in addition to all the other uh, COVID-induced challenges, to very rapidly say, where should we be rebuilding our supply chains as we go to the future? And I believe that this requires decisive action right now. You know, I've met with many of our uh, Taiwanese uh, partners, you know, companies like Foxtron, Wistron, you know, Pegatron, uh, Compal, et cetera, who are you know, now not able to ship products because they can't get them through the ports of Shanghai, right? And, then we, and we see this uh, dual circulation, et cetera, creating a major impetus. And if you think, you know, the way you think about it, it took five decades for our supply chains to sediment in Asia and China. We're not gonna change that overnight, but I think decided actions can move those supply chains across minerals, refining, IT subcomponents, et cetera, and start creating this uh, geographically resilient supply chain for the future. And I can assure you that many of our allies in Europe are thinking precisely the same way uh, as they've seen uh, the actions around, uh, you know, the war in Ukraine and rethinking how they uh, do uh, do their supply chains for the future as well. Can I just jump in with a with a quick quick point? Uh, and that is, uh, I don't think anyone is contemplating complete reshoring of our supply chain from end to end. That would be uh, prohibitively expensive. Uh, that would that would crush innovation. What we're, what we're talking about is rebalancing our supply chains and, and addressing some of the obvious weaknesses. And uh, Pat, 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 Pat mentioned this, but there's a lot of like-minded, uh, aligned, friendly economies around the world that, that, do, that are big parts of our supply chains. And I think we're looking at moving things around in that context. Bill Press. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, the... NSTC, it seems to me, is a little bit the blind man and the elephant, and there's a lot riding on exactly what it turns out to be. Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, PCAST in its own discussions will, will need to come to grips with this. I've heard a couple of different visions among the speakers, and, and I, I wonder if, you know, either they can ag- agree to, to disagree or, or assure us that they're, they're all on the same page. Let, let me say the kind of thing. Um, I think I think we all agree that the NSTC, because Congress says so, is an R and D facilitating organization. Uh, the Chips Act provides separately for manufacturing, for packaging, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I I haven't heard complete agreement on what its governance should be. Uh, I, I heard one position that says. It, it, it should be industry led and if I understood correctly, physically co-located with existing large facilities. But there's also a vision that, that says, although, although clearly it's a, it's a partnership that has to involve industry as well as u- universities, as well as startups, um, that the governance could be more distributed over that range of, of partners. Um, um, I, I, th- I think we, we, we heard the term self-governance or, or equivalent used several times for the NSTC. Um, we, we also heard at least one speaker kind of comment as if the NSTC would be run out of the Department of Commerce, which sounded less self-governing. Um, can, can the speakers help me? Is there a genuine difference of opinion here or, or um, you know, are you all on the same page? 
Can I just jump in there? <laughs> it's a little confusing uh, because it is a little confusing and it's early days. Uh, but I, 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 I do think that uh, folks are largely on, on the same page. And when I said uh, industry led, um, um, no one settled on the exact governance of this, but I think there's a consensus that um, this, the, the ideas, the, 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 the themes, the priorities should largely be set uh, by, by the industry. So do that, other speakers that, agree with, let me just ask John, do other speakers agree with that statement? Yes. Absolutely. I, I think that, uh, you know, in our field, uh, the industry in the U.S. has been the leader in the world for mm -hmm. semiconductors for 50 years. And it requires deep, deep competence to understand what's important and what's not. I think one of the characteristics that uh, any of these centers must have, it must solve problems that an individual company or, or, or focus group cannot solve, meaning uh, use the centers to touch those areas where competence from different areas have to intersect. And, and one of the reasons that you know, the, the whole uh, multi-die, multi-chip or chiplet direction is interesting, you can see that that is a door opener for people that have very big chips and people that have very small chips to somehow come together. Well, somehow come together is actually a very difficult thing because the technology to connect these things up needs to be legislated and understood by all. It's sort of what's the lingua franca of bringing chips together. And so while that's just, just uh, an analogy here, it, it, it begs the question, who can drive that? And a group of, of leadership companies can do that. And if you wanted to have an example from uh, yeah, that was that came out of Semitech over many years, out of that came a roadmap for semiconductors. And if nothing else, people decided at the same time to switch the size of the wafer. Just imagine half of the, the industry went one way, half the other. You would have nothing working. Now, it sounds a very simple example, but of course, it was very complicated. And then over time, it also started to predict what are the changes that are going to occur. And once it's in the book, everybody tried to do better than the book. And that has been one of the most powerful instruments to keep Moore's Law uh, uh, active. And I would propose that a similar type of feel for CISMORE, which is systemic, i.e. multidimensional, uh, it should be the essence of that. And you need to have some real pros in the middle of it. And, and if I might just add, uh, uh, Bill, um, the uh, um, I, I would say that there's probably 80% agreement on the outlines for NSTC, and there's still areas of disagreement um, that are you know yet to be uh, refined. And you know, essentially, we're you know we're uh, you know operating with opinions against a you know ill-defined law that's yet to be created, right, you know, by uh, Congress, but still there's an outline in there that has pretty good consensus on how it should be structured and what it should operate uh, upon. So do I think there's going to be some uh, vicious arguments on some fine points of governance structure, right, you know, specific domains? Yes. And I think those will be healthy arguments to get to a collective better answer. Okay, so we, we still have a half dozen questions left in less than 20 minutes or so. So um, please be efficient in questioning and answering if, if you are at all able to do so. So Eric Horvitz, you next. Yeah, thanks. I really enjoyed the talks. Um, so what you hear about, you know, core basics and substrate resolution capacity, CapEx and so on. But areas like AI are, are very fast paced and I get the sense that the designs and the fabs are focused on the, the AI workloads of today, uh, like. GPUs, which are becoming commoditized, but these are not ne not necessarily the workloads of the future, uh, whether for, whether for you know applications or the foundation. So I'm just curious if um, if we if we're doing enough in uh, by bringing our research uh, labs and frontier uh, efforts on AI, for example, and other topics too, together with our, our 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 industries to understand where things are going, so we can you know s you know skate to the puck versus be stuck uh, in what we believe are today's workloads. Um, I can jump into this. Uh, 
I, mean, I do think that you're exactly right. You know that, uh, and and in AI, it's exactly what uh, you just said. It's many many times, you know, a couple of years ago, people used to come in and say, "Can you run this AI model called ResNet that everybody was measuring themselves against?" And by the time we built the chip, it took 18 months to build it. ResNet was no longer of interest because we've moved on to three other four other models, right? And so the cycle of use and cycle of AI is going three or four times faster than the cycle of chip design. And so you really have to get back to kind of what are what, what are uh, base principles that allow us to innovate above that. And so um, there is the technology level, the silicon, the transistors, um, power, and all those those things that are incredibly important for us to build uh, computational units above it. But for us as a, a as a as an industry to think about what allows the innovation to have, happen above our chips. Right, and that's one of the things that uh, we, and maybe some of the conversations that are happening here, what are the standards that allow us to quickly deploy these types of common platforms that then enable additional companies to come and build applications that iterate quickly and allow us to make sure that the cycles that it takes for us to build, design, fab, deploy, all those things that we talked about when it comes to chip design, that that matches better with the cycle of innovation in AI, which is a new model every two months, right? And so I think those are the things that this industry is starting to figure out how to do, right? And with certainly you look at the GPUs, they're able to uh, do a lot more. Certainly you know, now we have uh, a number of other startups coming in with, um, applications that cover a range of, of products, but they cannot be too specific. If it's too specific, uh, it, it won't run. Uh, it won't run broadly enough. And like you said, won't get to where the puck is going to be. And the other thing that I just want to mention real quickly is that um, it's really great that all these companies are helping startups think about how to lower the cost of actually getting to uh, tools and getting to fab, fabs and things like that. There is a phase when startups go from research and idea to VC funded, right, and ramping up with a burn rate, right? And so when we think about those things, we're also thinking about how, you know, how can we actually shorten the time to actually a productive use case, right? And so in many cases, actually using a lower cost vehicle to tape out chips, it's actually not the best thing because we're burning dollars every day on headcount and being able to actually weigh those things and say, how can I get an idea onto silicon to a, a application quickly and iterate quickly becomes a high value. And so those are the things that I think we need to learn how to do. Speed's gonna be a very important aspect of how we innovate and how we iterate. Thanks. Just maybe to pile on slightly to help uh, Eric, you know, the chip I'm holding here is uh, our most advanced high performance computing chip, right? It has about a hundred billion transistors on it. But the thing about it is it has five different process technologies onto an advanced, uh, uh, you know, two and a half D uh, substrate uh, in this case. And part of this is gonna be enabling, and we've recently launched what we call UCIE, right? Basically a chiplet interface standard, which is gonna allow pieces of this to evolve very rapidly, but a lot more of it to be leveraged, right? And to be able to have these very fast turn uh, cycles of innovation, you know, for these advanced AI, you know, where we're developing the new, you know, uh, data types almost on a, a monthly basis, new things are emerging in that uh, area as Rodrigo, as well as then, because essentially this advanced package is becoming the motherboard of the past, right? You know, in the high performance interface. So essentially, you know, the uh, uh, chip has now become the motherboard with all these chiplets uh, upon it and system architecture advancements as well. And now the industry is moving to what's called CXL, a new systems architecture for memory and these high performance systems. So I believe some of these things are going to allow us to stay on the front edge of this uh, innovation when combined with industry standardization and alignment of academic and startup communities against them. Thank you. I would like to add to that uh, quickly. Uh, it is extremely important for the government to fund research on creating new design methodologies that allow very fast evolution of these hardware and software systems together. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting research out there uh, that will allow us to you know, spin chips in a month uh, uh, with complete software stacks. And that's very important going forward. Lisa Sue. Great. Well, first, I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, you've done a lot to help us in moving along our PCAST uh, you know, work on, um, on what to do in semiconductors. And, um, you know, 
I wanted to maybe comment uh, or actually ask Priyanka to, to expand a little bit more on the workforce development. I think what we're all looking for is very actionable recommendations as we, um, as we uh, you know, think about our PCAST recommendations. And I think this idea of uh, making semiconductors exciting is so important. Priyanka, when do we have to pick up these students? Like, you know, can we pick them up freshman year or do they need so much background? And how do we make this even more replicable? I think to Dan um, Arvizu's question earlier, how can we make it even easier uh, to replicate to, you know, not 20 universities, 40, 50, 100 universities to pick up more students? Um, certainly. So I think one of the big par parts of the problem to solve is uh, just teachers to teach the students, right? So hiring faculty who are excited about uh, putting in the time and effort to offer these courses and making it easy for them uh, to do that is going to be a very big uh, challenge. And in terms of when we, are, we, we should pick up these students as early as possible, um, but that requires a lot of work. It is very difficult to teach a freshman how to tape out a chip because there's a lot of knowledge that you need to have in order to be able to do that. So raising the level of abstraction for designing uh, these hardware software systems is very important. And so it's important to first fund the research in that direction that allows us to create systems that allow very quick prototyping and make chip design accessible to students with perhaps some software background. And then at the same time, build up the faculty and the educational capabilities at these universities uh, so that they are prepared to uh, offer these courses uh, in the time scales that we are talking about. Bill Dolly. Bill, you're muted. I had an early Q spot and then my network crashed. Um, so uh, I, I have a, a, a pair of related questions. So the first one is, you know, we've heard about how we can make things, re reduce the barriers to entry through some combination of raising the level of design, moving to, through, to a chiplet ecosystem. I'm curious if, you know, I looked at one of Priyanka's slides, it was the cost today is around $500 million. Um, what, what do we expect if we're wildly successful with some combination of chiplets and raising the level of design? What would be the investment to cash flow positive, you know, for a startup? And then the related question is, is really for Rod in that um, he, he went off and he said, you know, startups fill this part of the ecosystem where the market's not large enough for the big companies to get involved. But then what we see is the VCs have only invested in startups going after the AI market, which is the one market which is big enough that the big companies are involved. And they're basically, all the startups are now, rather than pioneering a new market, are trying to take share from the big companies. How do we break, you know, that mold and have the startups be going after new opportunities rather than just the big established ones? So let me throw that out there. Priyanka, you want to go first or you want me to take it? Uh, sure, I can comment a little bit on, you know, what can be enabled by making things more agile, right? Um, so we are talking about what Rodrigo mentioned, anything from a year to four years is what is realistic today in terms of getting a new chip out and getting it in production. We are talking about shrinking that year to a month right? And that is certainly possible uh, with the research that's going on in the uh, domain of raising the level of abstraction for design uh, for hardware software systems. So that turns your 500 million into what? I would take Rod, <laughs> Rod take that question. I, it's hard, hard for me to say exactly. You know, it depends on the complexity Depends on the complexity of the design, obviously. But Bill, you—I mean, you see this. I mean, the, the, I think what you're seeing is an exact reflection of what we've been talking about, which is the you know, cost that it takes to actually develop a chip and get to production requires the market to be of a certain size and requires the opportunity for a certain size for VCs to look at that and say, "I can get my returns." Right, and the risk of that is of a certain level, and so they, they, there, there are uh, um, there are. Uh, formulas that are used to figure out kind of what, you know, what, what are the sizes of the market and costs that make sense, right? Now, uh, this is why I go back to saying really almost more important than reducing the cost because it does take X amount of engineers to develop any production quality chip, right? And, and uh, uh, I don't think... I don't think you, maybe Priyanka's the next flow will help us, right? Today, we're not there yet. It's not a 20 person get together in the garage and can tip out an enterprise class 
uh, uh, chip, you know, it requires people. And so that burn rate is actually fairly, fairly significant. And so when we're actually in a position where we're taking VC uh, funding and trying to create a design a chip, we're very conscious of every month that passes because that burn rate is, um, is um, um, matched with zero revenue. There's no revenue until you can get to uh, an article that somebody wants. And so I am really focused around what are avenues that allow startups of big and small to shorten its cycle to a proof point that says this has commercial value to customers. And so um, because that first engagement with customers is not enough to be self-sustaining yet, right? That just proves that, oh, your, your device has some value to my industry. And now let's begin the process of actually engaging, getting to production, but it takes yet some more time before you get to production. And that's when you're actually starting to be self-sustaining. Right. And so for us, really thinking about what ways can we create opportunities for not just public sector engagements, which I think, you know, the national labs have done a tremendous job in engaging with startups, but other institutions, ideally commercial institutions to create programs that allow startups to not have to go through the traditional procurement processes that large companies have put in place to buy in volume to be able to quickly iterate and say, is this a value or not? Because as an industry, what startups need to do is quickly think about this idea is if it does not have a market fit, we can pivot quickly and we should know how to pivot quickly because that is something that startups are in fact set up for, right? Move, try out ideas and move quickly to ideas that are more valuable to a market. And until we actually engage with the market, we don't know, right? And so that would be my one important ask to say, let's think about how can we get that startup to market engagement as quickly as possible to create more good ideas that have value in the commercial market. Um, because I actually think that there are a lot of good ideas. They're almost right. They're almost right, but they end up failing before they get to that right point because they're not enough. They, they run out of time and they're not enough commercial engagements to actually guide them to say, if you tweak A, B, and C, you'll be an incredibly successful semiconductor idea. Right. And so I think those are the things that I would really emphasize to make sure that more feedback, more commercial feedback to semiconductor startups are coming faster to allow them to actually tune and refine the product. OK, well, we've, we've got to be really efficient here in these last three questions. So Andrea Goldsmith. And, you know, I'm not necessarily the most efficient, but I'll try. I'll do my best. Uh, thank you all for an incredible uh, discussion. This has been amazing, and I could ask questions for the next half hour, but I'll make them very quick. So, so first, I wanted to, to pick up on Lisa's question on attracting talent. Uh, I, I worry about that more than anything else. We really don't have faculty in the universities uh, to train the next generation because we stopped investing in semiconductors. Um, and the students see so many other opportunities and foreign students can stay in their countries and, and have opportunities as well. So how do we really quickly attract the talent that we need uh, to this field? And then the only other thing I'll just ask is, we need to invest wisely. What are we missing of everything that's been discussed in this conversation and other things you've seen? What else should we, PCAST, be recommending for investment that will spur um, leadership in innovation in this field? Let me just jump in with one quick word here on the talent. For a quick fix, uh, we got to fix our broken uh, immigration system, Andrea. I think that that is there's two sides to this coin. One is cultivating uh, indigenous talent, talent, and the other one is encouraging the talent that we devote tremendous resources to educating. Um, I think Art said, staple a green card onto the onto the, uh, the certificate, the graduation certificate. If, if if we don't crack that nut, we're we're just really um, Put, putting our uh, one hand talk, uh, behind our back. I agree with oh, that. Just, I think uh, the existing. So I, I'm just going to, and, and the, if, for, for those of you who are familiar with the, the politics of Washington, um, you know, there, there's actually some, some inertia for, or not inertia, some momentum for taking care of uh, uh, high skilled immigration. Uh, visas, but the problem is uh, the immigration discussion is all wrapped up into one whole, a singular undertaking, and it's very, very hard to, in that environment, just to, to strip something like this out and move forward with it. But that's that's the pol political reality we're facing here in Washington. 
Francis Collins. Yes, I agree. Sorry, go ahead. Well, this has been a very informative discussion, especially for somebody like me who had no real background in, in this area until today. I thought uh, chiplets were some sort of small snack food, but I've learned a lot from all of you. Uh, basically, what I want to ask, though, is what's the timetable over which we should imagine this kind of intervention being necessary? Nobody's used the words market failure here, but one could say you've had an industry that's been remarkably successful in the United States and now is in need of significant investments from the U.S. government. If I were the president uh, sort of looking at this, I, I would want to know, okay, over what timetable? So Pat Gelsinger, maybe I'll ask you, how do you see this looking in five years and what will be the ongoing need uh, for government mm -hmm. involvement? Yeah, thank you, Francis, and good to chat with you again. Um, you know, my, my view, you know, in the moonshot that I've suggested, you know, if we look at the 12% today, we were 37 uh, 30 years ago, now we're at 12%. You know, and I believe that uh, you know we should set uh, in the U.S. a goal to get back to 30% manufacturing, and in the Europe back to 20% by about a decade from now. Right? I think it takes us that long. I think that will take Chips Act one, and if that's successful, and if we figure that out, you know, we'll probably take a Chips Act two, right? Of you know maybe one and a half times the magnitude of Chips Act one, but you know we'll have proof points of how to work uh, at that point. And I believe that that has the opportunity, you know, to spark a reinvestment in not only R&D, but manufacturing and this rebalancing of supply chain. You know, I think this is about a decade problem to show that being the case. Uh, so I would hope that uh, we start to see meaningful shifts. But, you know, it takes, you know, uh, almost four years to build a new factory uh, in these spaces. So right, you just can't build these high complexity things. You know, it takes, uh, you know, about five years to, you know, start, you know, popping out uh, new uh, PhD graduates in research uh, areas, discovering, you know, new material types and chemicals and so on. You know, so I think, you know, the, the picture that I would say is CHIPS Act 1, you know, is an extraordinary step in uh, the next three years. I think if that is successful, it needs to be followed by a CHIPS Act 2. And uh, that is, you know, we should think about this essentially as a decade of, you know, if I can use the uh, phrase industrial policy to rebuild this most critical industry on American uh, soil. And if we accomplish the, what I've described by the end of the decade, and by the way, Europe, you know, if you would go ask uh, Vestager and Van der Loyne and Thierry Breton, right, you know, and so on, they would exactly mimic what I just said, you know, at this 20% uh, level. And that's exactly what uh, President Van der Loyne of the EU uh, described in her policy speech about six months ago. <laughs> and I believe all of these are achievable in that time frame. You know, substantial, but achievable. Okay. Thanks. Joe, Joe Keone, you're going to close it out for us quickly. All right. Well, I wish I was on the closer because I've got some things I just wanted to ask you. But first say, you know, when I was trying to decide where to manufacture, I visited China, Mexico, other places. And I decided not to manufacture in China because of both the way the labor was treated uh, with what I witnessed, and then also the involuntary IP sharing <laughs> that I feel. Um, <laughs> so I guess uh, one, you know, I, I, well, I came into this thinking we need to subsidize semiconductor companies the way we do farming, but, uh, but I see how, you're investing 30% of your R&D, 30% of your revenue in R&D, and still making an amazing operating profit. Uh, so I guess I'm wondering, why aren't you on your own investing in manufacturing in North America, not the US? And then what can the industry and government do to help keep manufacturing in the US? Yeah, and you know, John should probably add to this, but you know, the Delta. If I was building this next factory in uh, Korea, Taiwan, Asia, it's thirty percent is our thumb in the air. And uh, you know, uh, with that, right? If I'm pl if I'm plunking ten billion uh, into a factory, and I can do that thirty percent cheaper in Asia, where should I build it, Joe? Right? I mean, these are extraordinary numbers, and the European. Right, uh, their Chips Act is modeled equivalently is to essentially rebalance that. And right now we're fighting two issues. Right, we're fought, fighting the cost as well as the consolidation of supply chain uh, that has occurred in Asia. 
So if we're going to bring this industry back to American soil, it's going to take intervention. Otherwise, you're going to continue to leverage an integrated supply chain in Asia and fight against these very substantial right, uh, capital cost dynamics that are in place in those uh, uh, parts of the world. That's, you know, it didn't get here by accident. The U.S. never stood up and voted that we should get rid of semiconductor manufacturing. That vote was never taken. But I can promise you that there were votes taken in China, Taiwan, and Korea that they were going to attract this industry to their soils. And they have invested enormously, you know, for in the last uh, three, four decades for that reshoring to occur. And it has been extraordinarily successful for them. Now we have to decide if we want to reverse those trends that have been underway now for three decades. And, and I I would not frame this as subsidizing our industry. I would frame it as incentivizing our industry. We're obviously not an, an industry in decline. We're, we're, we're very successful, but as Pat so well laid out, our government doesn't provide the same kind of incentives that governments around the world do. And it's just, it's just, you, it, it, and mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the chief explanation as to why um, our, our manufacturing has declined over the last 30 or 40 years. And, and yeah, unless, let's go ahead, Pat, sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to say, and right now I'm going to make a decision, right? Whether I'm going to build in Germany or in Ohio first, right? And our Congress gets to decide where I'm going to build that next factory. And at this point in time, I think I'm going to see euros to incentivize that landing on European soil before I see dollars, right? And to me, you know, that is just you know, almost implausible, right? The U.S. started this agenda with the CHIPS Act well a year before the bureaucratic slow Europeans, and they're going to be delivering us the incentives before we see it on U.S. soil. And, you know, these numbers are so big that you're not economically competitive without such incentives in the world scene. You know, it's that simple. Well, Pat, so can we I just say one thing? No, we, we need to, uh, Joe, we, right. need to, um, we need to cut this <laughs> off, and that, this is probably a good place to do it. Uh, Pat, Happy to talk further, Joe. Priyanka, Rodrigo, Art, and John, thank you for the um, incredibly informative uh uh, presentations and discussions, and um, they will certainly inform our deliberations. And I'll turn it over to Francis Collins now. Yes, indeed. Thank you all for a really informative discussion. <laughs> uh, we have a public comment period here, and we have one individual who has requested an opportunity to offer such comments. And assuming that um, the technology is going to work, I would like to call on Mr. Greg Bird to come into the Zoom meeting and offer two minutes of comments. Mr. Bird, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, can you can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Thank okay, you. Very good. Thank you very much. And I wish I was here for the prior part of the conversation. Um, it's uh, I think we can add a lot to that. Um, my name is Gregory Bird. I'm the Deputy Secretary General of GSOL. We are a Swiss-based global public-private partnership. I thank you for the invitation to be here today following the letter to the PCAST Secretariat from the Honorable Yves Leterme, who is the former Belgian Prime Minister and the Chairman of our European Advisory Board. Mr. Leterme recognizes that PCAST's mission is of vital importance to increase the competitiveness of the transatlantic economy and maintain the U.S. and allied leadership. Nearly one year ago, President Biden posed five key questions to PCAST, asking how science and technology can benefit the USA's economic prosperity and national security for the next 75 years. The USA needs a comprehensive strategy to achieve the president's objective to ensure the USA stays on top as the wealthiest country in the world and the most powerful country in the world. That is, the USA needs a strategy to leverage the USA's strengths in innovation and reshore manufacturing in the USA. A strategy to unite the world behind the USA and to acquire USA products. And a strategy to compete with China. I am pleased to announce that following 22 years of research and development on the digital economy, the world's largest public-private sector coalition has developed the tangible roadmap required to implement such strategies. This coalition includes more than 150 countries through their pan-regional organizations and the world's top information technology firms, several of which are from the USA. 
This roadmap will empower national business-to-business e-commerce, financial, and insurance firms with new digital tools to service and boost our manufacturing and deliver enormous benefits by the year 2031. Increasing the USA's GDP by 15%. Create a new $2.9 trillion digital services industry within the USA. Generate more than 26 million manufacturing, agriculture, and services jobs. Lower the carbon footprint and enhance the resilience of the global value chains through Boost USA manufacturing. Led by the world's top technology firms, the implementation of this game-changing innovation is now happening. Accordingly, we propose to convene a briefing session with you to deepen your understanding of this initiative and to invite your participation to enhance its success towards achieving the USA's leadership objectives. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you for your comments and for telling us about this initiative, this roadmap. If there is any written material that the PCAS co-chairs could have a look at, that would be helpful, just a brief description. Uh, perhaps you could follow up with that if there's something we could have a look at. Will do. Thank you very All much. Right. All right. I think that is our only public comment. Uh, so let me turn this now over to Francis Arnold for any closing remarks for our public component of this meeting. I just would like to thank everyone in PCAS and especially our, our speakers today and the public who is watching for your participation in this important discussion, so important for the future of our country. And with that, I'll leave it to Maria to close our session today. Now, I will just uh, add my thanks to the speakers for just uh, outstanding presentations that really have gotten us thinking, thinking and have deepened our uh, understanding of things. So, um, so that concludes um, our public session and um, thanks to all of you for tuning in.